In the last video, we introduced plants as a kingdom. We talked about the characteristics of plants and their origins from an aquatic ancestor. We discussed the hurdles that land plants had to overcome to handle their terrestrial environment. In this video, we'll discuss our first group of plants, the bryophytes. An example of the bryophytes are the mosses. We'll let mosses represent the whole group of bryophytes. Let's have a look at mosses. Notice its size and notice how it grows. The defining characteristic of the bryophytes is that they are non-vascular. What does this mean, vascular or non-vascular? Well, it means that they have no internal system of conduction. They don't have xylem or phloem to transport water or sugars throughout the plant body. Lacking this internal system of conduction means that mosses or bryophytes must rely solely on diffusion to move materials through their body. In what ways does that limit mosses? Well, what does vascular tissue provide for plants? This internal system of conduction is an efficient way to move materials throughout the plant body. Let's How do you accomplish this movement without vascular tissue? Well, the answer is diffusion. Is diffusion efficient over great distances? No. Would diffusion be good enough for a moss? Well, let's look at what a moss is. Is there any part of this moss that's any great distance away from the soil or from the surface? Look at the individual pieces. It's all really small. So diffusion isn't efficient enough manner for, for, uh, to move materials through a bryophyte. What else does vascular tissue provide plants? Recall that vascular tissue also provides a system of structural support. If you don't have this structural support, in what ways are you limited? How are bryophytes limited, besides uh, being small, uh, by lacking this structural support? Well, look at the pictures. Mosses grow out across surfaces rather than up. They can't grow upwards without this structural support. Before we look at the other characteristics of bryophytes, let's go through the life cycle of a moss. Remember that all plant life cycles are variations of the generic alternation of generations life cycle that we've seen before. Let's start with a blank page. So, we have this green fuzzy moss on the ground and we want to see its life cycle. We need to zoom in to see the structures evolved. So, let's just pick a spot and zoom in and see what we see. Pick there and there. So we see a structure that looks like this and here we have a structure that looks like this. Now, this structure on, on uh, you can't see what I'm doing here, this structure over here uh, on the left uh, contains uh, a jacket of cells and inside that jacket of cells, this jacket of cells is called the archegonium whoops that's off the page and this structure is called the antheridium inside the archegonium, or this jacket of cells we have an egg being produced there's our egg. And the antheridia produce sperm. Sperm and egg are gametes, which means that this moss, this green fuzzy stuff, belongs to which generation? What do we call this generation that makes gametes? Right, we call it the gametophyte. Gametophytes make gametes. Well, what are gametes used for? fertilization. So, grab this. The sperm is going to fertilize the egg. We're going to bring it over here. Show fertilization happening over here. The question though is, how does the sperm get to this egg? Well, the answer is, it's going to swim. Now remember, we're not talking about a great distance. We zoomed in tight here. But this sperm has to swim to this egg. This brings us to a very important point. 
Bryophytes require water for reproduction. While mosses are terrestrial plants, they have not lost this property of their aquatic ancestry. This is a leftover remnant of their aquatic uh, nature. Well, let's put this away for now. Put that up there as a reminder for later. But where does this fertilization event occur? Well, the sperm swims to the egg in the archegonium. And the result of fertilization is a zygote. So, inside the archegonium, we have our zygote. Now, the zygote's going to grow. What is the zygote going to become? Well, the zygote's going to grow into our sporophyte generation. But it's going to grow right up out of the archegonium, which we would still have down here. This is the sporophyte. Well, what do sporophytes make? Well, hopefully remember that sporophytes make spores. Why do you think it is that the sporophyte grows upwards when the moss it grows outwards? Think about it. Write it down. Here's a picture. Here's a picture of the sporophytes. You can see growing up off of the uh, moss down here. And the moss sporophyte grows upwards to whoops to help spore dispersal. It wouldn't do any good to produce a spore down here, have it drop and try to grow and compete um, against this thriving adult moss. But if a spore is produced here, and as it falls, maybe the wind catches it and carries it way over here, and now we can grow into a new fuzzy green moss over here, not in competition with the parent. Let's go back to our cycle and finish. I can take that out of there. So, what do the spores become? Well, spores grow up and become new green fuzzy moss. Now, we need to go through this again and add a little bit more uh, of important information. What is the ploidy of a spore? Well, spores are always haploid. So the spore grows through mitosis and cell division to make a gametophyte. And since mitosis doesn't change our ploidy, the gametophyte is haploid. The gametophytes make gametes egg and sperm, and the gametes have to be haploid. They make those gametes by mitosis. Fertilization is the fusion of two gametes, so that the ploidy of a zygote is diploid. That zygote grows up to be a sporophyte, and it grows by mitosis, so the sporophyte is also diploid. But the sporophyte, which is diploid, makes a haploid spore, so we need a round of meiosis to produce the spores. Now let's think about what other characteristics we now know about mosses. In mosses, the dominant generation is the gametophyte generation. When you look at moss on the ground, that green fuzzy stuff you're seeing is the haploid gametophyte generation. The sporophyte part of the life cycle is small, and dependent on the gametophyte. What else did we learn over here? Well, hopefully this one. Bryophytes require water whoops, for reproduction. In what way does this requirement of water limit mosses? Well, hopefully you see that it limits bryophytes to the habitats in which they can live. It must be in a moist humid, humid habitat where there's enough moisture for the sperm to swim to the egg to complete the reproductive cycle. These environments look moist. You can see the moisture in the soil there. Um, it's near a lake there. Which side of a tree does moss grow on? See how many outdoorsmen we have in the, the crowd here? Well, the north side. Do you know why? Well, it's the north side of the tree that receives the most rainfall and the most moisture. So as we look at these characteristics, non-vascular, dominant generations can meet a fight and require water-free production, we can see some ways in which bryophytes are limited. 
They're limited in the size. They can't be big because they need to rely on diffusion. They're limited in their direction of growth. Without structural support, they grow out and not up. And they're limited in their habitat because they require water for reproduction. Now we have a few more um, small characteristics that we can talk about for bryophytes and we'll just list them on the next page here. Bryophytes are small and thin which makes them good for relying on diffusion. They have leaf-like structures but no true leaves. They have stem-like structures but no true stems. And they have root-like structures called rhizoids for absorbing moisture from the soil. Another characteristic is that mosses will often be the first type of plants to in inhabit a novel environment. So there's our review on bryophytes. Uh, next up will be a, uh, a video on ferns, and then we'll come back for uh, the seed plants.